don't remember how far we got into plot the other day. Uh, did we discuss plot or how much? I took everything out of my book and lost my spot. Um, author's arrangement, I'll do it real quickly. Author's arrangement of incidents in a story. So you can have a plot that begins uh, chronologically. You start at the beginning, go to the middle, go to the end. In Medius Race, you get dropped in the middle of things. And then you're told what happens earlier, okay? Maybe through narration, maybe through flashback of different kinds. Um, device that informs us about events that happened earlier. So we're going to skip a bit. Go to, that's what I forgot to tell my, talk about with my previous class. I knew there was a passage that I'd um, forgotten to discuss with my first class, and I forgot it again today. Um, that's okay. Pages 72 and 73 is really important stuff about plot notes. So. Exposition, rising action, conflict, foreshadowing, all that kind of stuff. Exposition, background information you need to know to make sense of what is going on. Okay? I think I'd ask you to read, get the right author, Hawthorne's Minister's Black Veil today. We're not going to get to it, we're not going to discuss it. But, What exposition is missing? Let me ask you that question. What, is, what does the minister do at the opening of that short story? He wears a veil to church and preaches a sermon, and he never takes the veil off from that moment till he... Well, he never takes it off. I was going to say till he dies, but he doesn't take it off then either. What exposition would be really nice to have? Why does he put the veil on? Does he ever answer that question? I mean, literally, does he say, I put the veil on because? No. Is it kind of answered? Yes, it is kind of answered. We'll talk about that when we get to it. But that's, that's the exposition is information you need. You know, um, I'm going to use a lot of references to popular culture and other books and things like that. A lot of the ones that I'll use will be Harry Potter, uh, the Lord of the Rings stories, and Star Wars. I'm a Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings nerd. Star Wars, I've just seen a lot, you know, and they, they really work for fleshing out a lot of stuff about literature. Um, in the Lord of the Rings, J.K. not J.K. Rowling, J.R.R. Tolkien gives two key chapters that are entirely exposition. And in the film, it's done at the beginning of, part of this is done, at the beginning of uh, the Fellowship of the Ring film. We see images, we see things happening, and we hear Kate Blanchett's voice as the character of Galadriel explain what is happening. That's all exposition. What's the purpose of it? It's to bring you up to speed so that you know what the stupid little ring is when the film actually opens with Bilbo's birthday party and leaving the ring for Frodo, okay? Um, J.K. Rowling gives us the backstory, the exposition, throughout all seven novels. That is, she reveals a little bit at a time, okay? We don't get that exposition, again, with the minister's Black Veil. You're going to see when we get to Barn Burning. We don't necessarily get the exposition that tells us why Abner Snopes is the way he is. I think it's because it's psychological. It's, there's, there's not an event that turned Abner Snopes into what he is. He's just a mean, rotten, no good SOB. There's, there's no other way to put it, okay? So, rising action, okay, once, once you get that information, it gives us a context. The plot gains momentum with rising action. A complication that intensifies the situation. What's the rising action in the minister's black veil? He shows up at church with the veil on. Okay. How does that complicate the situation? 
um, a professor did this. Man, this was a long time ago. I want to say it was in the 80s. Psychology professor did an experiment on these students, you know, because the captive audience, they can't leave, so to speak. And the guy came into class, I think it was the first day of class, with a bag over his head. Two holes, so, you know, he could see. And did every day like that. It was entirely to judge people's reactions. It was part of a, some study he was doing. Okay. So what would the complication, you know, that, that creates the complication because we like to be able to see each other. Some of you, I don't think if anybody in here knows, some students are wearing masks. A lot of my colleagues are wearing masks. You know, one of the ways, you know, when I do roll that I get names is I put, you know, Amaya, face to name. If I can't see your face, I, you know, I'm never going to know you. So all the students I taught last fall, until whenever it was, October, November, that the mask thing dropped, I'm not going to remember them ever. And I won't be able to say, I recognize your face, because the most I could do is put a mask on. <laughs> Maybe I'll recognize you that way. Okay. So rising action, something that creates conflict. That's the complication. That's what's meant by complication. Okay. Turn to page 73. So you get the term conflict. Okay. What everybody knows what conflict is, right? It's when things don't get along. Life is conflict. Or as one of my favorite films, I'll make reference to it. Probably none of you have seen it because when I allude to it now, you know, I get totally blank stares. Stares. Uh, one of my favorite films has a line in it: "Life is pain." Highness, anybody know the film? Princess Bride. Okay. Much, much better film than book. The book's horrible. Just, I mean, slit your throat with horrible. It's really bad. So, something that creates tension. Conflict might be between people. Conflict can be between a person and a thing. Right? Uh, Melville's magnum opus, Moby Dick. The conflict is between Ahab and the great white whale. Is that, is that because the great white whale sits there and thinks in its underwater lair, I'm going to kill Ahab? Is the way the whale is kind of described within the novel, you think that it has something out for Ahab. Ahab definitely has something out for it. Okay? So, what else? You've got foreshadowing. A suggestion of what is yet to come. Okay. Um, usually the suggestion is kind of oblique. That is, it's not directly stated. Let me give you a religious example. But I'm going to give one that's, that is kind of directly stated. Um, no, take that back. Jesus at one point is going to say to his disciples, where I am going, you cannot come. And then he says, well, take that back. You will come, but you're not going to want to come. What's he referring to? What's the foreshadowing? The crucifixion, his death. He says, you can't come where I'm going. And then he backs up and says, you will, that is, you are going to die of the apostles, the 12 disciples, I believe only one. Was it killed? John, author of Revelation, the Gospel of John and such. All the others, you know, skin, flayed alive, crucified upside down, burned at the stake, you know, the whole nine yards. Okay? So foreshadow. Everybody knows what foreshadowing is. Then protagonist or hero, and I put on the board the other day, Protos Agonist, first or chief sufferer. Notice it says, or hero. What do we usually mean by hero? We, real world, not literature. Define a hero. My daughter, uh, my eldest daughter, became a nurse 
completed her nursing, got her license, right as COVID blew up. Became an ICU nurse. I mean, talk about being thrown into the fire. You know, it's a, it's either sink or swim. Well, she swam. Um, what did you start seeing real, real quickly after COVID really blew up? Outside hospitals and medical clinics and stuff. There are still some that have them. Heroes work here. Okay. Why? They're put, they put their needs behind everybody else's, right? I mean, think about it. They're putting themselves in danger. Okay? We think of uh, members of the military as heroes. When I grew up, 60s and 70s, no, they weren't. I mean, when guys would come back from Vietnam, they were spat on. They were called every foul name in the book. Okay? Now we don't think of them that way. Police, firemen, didn't used to be thought of as heroes unless or until they did what? Ran into a burning building? Saved somebody? Okay? 9-11 changed that a little bit so that it was kind of this blanket, you know, if you're a cop or you're a fireman, you're a hero. And it might be, you know, let's be honest, let's say you're one of the few, because it is relatively few, you're one of the bad cops. Just bad. You still call that person a hero? So I've got a bit of an issue by saying protagonist or hero, because not every protagonist is heroic. So define hero. Used to be hero meant somebody who went above and beyond the call of duty. Brother in law used to be a cop. You know, and, and he would frequently point out, you know, Ted, cops aren't actually required to save your life if they can. There's nothing in there, you know, when they sign on the dotted line, that nothing that says, I've got to risk my life for yours. It's assumed by society, right? So, protagonist or hero? Chief sufferer, hero. What's really meant there? The main character. But not every, again, not every main character is heroic, okay? Or heroine might be a woman, okay? Opposite to that, you have the antagonist, the against sufferer. What's the antagonist really? It's the person responsible for the main suffering of the protagonist. The antagonist in Moby Dick is the whale. Okay. Um, first Star Wars, who's the antagonist? <sighs> Yeah, Darth Vader, right? I mean, it's pretty clear. Who's the protagonist? Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker. First three films. He's the protagonist. He's the main slash chief father. Uh, father. It's Luke, I am your father. No, you know, chief sufferer kind of a thing. You find out daddy's Satan. Okay? So, suspense. Everybody knows what suspense is, right? Tension builds until... Tension builds, and it creates what in you? The reader, it could build excitement. It could build tension. Okay. Let's say final semester, senior year, getting ready to graduate. Walk in the procession, get the diploma of all nine yards, and it all comes down to you have to pass a particular course and you don't know if you're going to. Something's happened. You missed some classes. It's borderline. Are you cool with that? Or are you just, hey man, chill. I'm totally fine. No! You're riddled with suspense because you don't know what's going to happen. How many of you have seen the film Jaws? I know, it's really, really old. You can only, you know. How's it begin? You got the girl swimming out in the ocean. She's naked and stuff. And you start to hear, boom, 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 
boom, boom, boom. The music, this is what makes John Williams just absolute sheer genius. The music builds the suspense because you don't know there's a shark here. You don't see it. You see her. Put him, put him. So now, you know, 1977, 78, a lot of people were afraid to go in the water, uh, especially after the New England coast. Okay? Climax, resolution, denouement. Climax, moment of greatest emotional tension. What's the climax? Third Star Wars film. Original, 1977, 1980, 1983. Uh, Return of the, or Revenge of the Jedi. I can never remember the title. That stupid movie. The one when they blow up the Death Star. That's the first movie when they blow up the Death Star. Yeah, yeah, it's a long time ago. And, uh, it's when Luke is being tortured by the Emperor. Bzzz, and he's calling out, Father, Father. And he's saying, your father's not going to help you. He's mine. And what does Darth Vader do? Chucked him down the hole. We can talk later about where there's a huge problem in that, in that plot. I mean, it's just mind-blowingly huge. To me, at least. Right? So, that's the climax. The resolution is the solution to the conflict. Well, what's the resolution there? Luke said earlier, Father, there is good in you. I can feel it. So when Darth Vader throws him the emperor down and tells Luke, leave me, you have saved me. What does Luke try to do? He, he wants to keep him alive. He wants to talk. <laughs> he wants to find out how did you become what you are kind of a thing. All right? Resolution pretty easy, also known, you know, French word, denouement, which just means the untying of the knot. And we can describe this, you know, rising action, falling action, climax up here, resolution here, conflict and complication here. So you can describe almost any work of fiction. You can visually portray it as a pyramid. You're going to see when we get to drama, there is a variety of drama, a genre of drama called comedy, because this applies also to the tragic form of drama. We can flip that to describe or to use to visualize the comedy form of drama. All right? So, okay, now we can go. So skip everything else in that section. And go to character, page 107. Yeah, characterization. Do we talk about this at all? I don't think we got this far. Characterization. It's how an author creates a character. And it's not just, you know, so and so is a character in my novel. How do you, how do you create characters? Showing and telling. Turn to page 110 and follow it. Showing and telling. Look at the second one first. Where an author tells us about a character. Okay. So it you know, gives, us this, gives us a description. Tells us what the character does and says. As in narration. John went to the store and said. That's telling. Showing is where we see. John, get up, go to the store, and speak. Which of those do you think is more effective at making characters who seem real? Merely describing or seeing the character say and or do things? Is it? And suddenly you're right. Um, is it more realistic for the narrator to maybe Jordan for a minute, to see into her mind and tell us what's there, what she's thinking? Man, I can't wait to get out of this coffee store. Or for her to suddenly pipe up, shut up, Sherman, and let us leave. You know? <laughs> You'd say it's more real, more realistic for the latter. It's more believable for the latter. 
Okay? Because, back down to the bottom of the page, characters can be convincing whether they're presented by telling or showing, provided their actions are motivated. That is, do you find a reason to see why this person does this thing? Okay? Is, is something shown us or told us about why the person behaves the way they do? Right? I'll give a little thing about Abner Snopes in the short story Barn Burning. We're not told why he is, or we're not shown why he is the way he is. We're just shown he is the way he is. And again, dirty, rotten, SOB. Pyromaniac, possible murderer slash could be murderer, racist, you know, what made him that way? Get a hundred psychologists, you're going to get a hundred different answers. Why people are the way they are, you know. So, if we take the motivation as being realistic, that is, if we see a, a, a character and we say, okay, I can kind of believe that. Then we say that person is plausible. That character is plausible. Their actions are plausible. What's meant by plausible? You ever heard the phrase? Plausible. Deny. Oh, no, that's an L. Plausible deniability. It's kind of a phrase used in the intelligence community. If they want to keep something, let's say, you know, they need to do something the president wants them to do, but they want to make it look like the president doesn't have anything to do with this. You give the president what's called plausible deniability. Plausible, believable deniability. Okay. How do you make sure it's plausible? Nothing to connect the president with, let's say, what's being done. It's a real problem with this idea in the modern American state. Why? There's a paper trail everywhere. Whether it's literal paper or digital paper. You know, the FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago, Trump's home. What were they after? This. You know that every email you send through the MTSU system is stored? Or at least it used to be. It used to be where they could go back and search and find it. Even after you hit delete on your own computers. If you think something's gone just because you've deleted it, no, 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 no. If the only way for it to be gone, Hillary Clinton knew this. Bleach <laughs> or, you know, a professional erasing service, or you take the thing and you drill holes in it. Like if you get rid of a computer, don't just think, oh, I'm going to erase my hard disk. Even if you reformat it, it's not necessarily done. In order to make it where you can't get that information, you've got to physically destroy that hard drive, okay? So make it plausible deniability. Um, what else? If a character is motivated and plausible, then, and consistent, then that character can kind of become what in our minds? This is not in the book, but it's part of what we're doing here. Real. Did the character Hamlet ever really live? We're 99% sure no. 1% not sure because he may be based on an old Danish guy character named Ambleth. Okay. So there's that 1% possibility. Is he real in a sense? Yeah, he's real. Because people can identify with him. It's like, he could be my brother kind of a thing. Okay? Absurdist literature, anti-hero. Absurdist literature is just what it sounds like. It's absurd. It makes no sense. It says, ultimately, there is no meaning to life. We're going to find an absurdist character in... Um, Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. Because he's a character 
who doesn't think there's any meaning to life. He's not an anti-hero, however, because an anti-hero doesn't have any control or has little control over the events of his or her life. And that character in that story has an awful lot of control. How do we know? Because he kills people. If you kill people, what are you ultimately doing? You're asserting your control. It might be, I'm asserting my control. Boom! Why? I've just controlled her. Boom! I've just controlled him. They're no longer breathing and living. All right? Anti-heroes, they like that control. You might have been forced to read Catcher in the Rye, Catch-22, something like that in high school. Why? I have no idea. Other than to make you suicidal or something. Dynamic character undergoes change. In the first two Star Wars films, A New Hope, 1977, and Empire Strikes Back, 1980, does Darth Vader undergo any kind of change? Do we see him sit some point under a tree and go, I should really become a better person. I need to work on reaching out to others and empathizing. No, he doesn't. He's just, you know, and killing. What about the third film? He undergoes massive change. Why? Because he's redeemed. I don't mean Jesus, you know, heaven redeemed. He kind of, Lucas does kind of imply that when we're going to see him later on. But he changes. There is still good in you, Luke says. And he says, it's too late for me. And it turns out it's not too late for him. Okay? So a dynamic character undergoes change. With Abner, I'll tell you right now. It might show up on a quiz question. Is Abner a dynamic or static character? Abner doesn't change. From the first point you see him to the last point you see him. He is the exact same person. And you could even say, we can go down to the bottom of the page, he's a flat character, he's a stuck character. You might as well have a cardboard cutout of an evil person, you know, Hitler, and put Abner Snows on his face. Because there's, there's no dimension out, well, there is some dimensionality. It's dimensionality of evil. <laughs> if, if you listen to what he says, we get a bit of an inkling as to how his mind works, and it's kind of twisted, okay, in terms of what he says to his son. So, a dyna sorry, dynamic character changes. Abner's a static character. He doesn't change at all. Dynamic character does change. The little boy in Barn Burning is very dynamic. He changes from the beginning of the story to the end. He changes in very big ways. From the beginning to the end of the story. Parson Hooper, Minister's Black Veil. Does he change? Once he puts that veil on, he's pretty static. But it's once he puts the veil on. Do we ever see him that is within the actual course of the story without the veil? No, we don't. Okay? But what does putting the veil on tell us about him, about the page before the story began? He didn't have it on. See, the putting on the veil is what makes him, I would argue, more dynamic than static. He changes like that very morning, he puts it on. But from that point on, he's the same. Okay. Um, the foil helps to reveal, by contrast, the distinctive qualities of another character. I found this on the web. Oh, shut up. The other character does not have to be the main character or the protagonist or the heroine. Okay. You are a foil for your friends and family, or maybe your enemies. We, we, not in the literary sense, not in the sense that we're literary characters, but every one of us, 
brings out good qualities and bad qualities of certain people, right? Are there certain people that you just don't mix well with? Because it's like, he opens his mouth and you just want to, you know. And there are others that you just want to spend all your time with. Right? That's the, I, the foil idea. Usually, the foil brings out the best or worst characteristics of another character. Sometimes the foil is merely meant almost like a mirror. Shakespeare says in Hamlet, the purpose of drama is to serve as a mirror to nature. What does that mean? It shows us what we are. I don't know about you. Sometimes I don't need a mirror. There is an awful lot of times I don't want to know what I'm like. Just put it away. Okay? So, flat character, stock characters. Flat character embodies one or two qualities, ideas, traits that can be described. I'll give one away. Abner Snopes. Pyromaniac. He likes to see things burn. But he uses fire for a purpose. It doesn't make him any less a pyromaniac. Okay? Evil. Not a good parent. It's pretty flat. Darth Vader. Uh, evil. Vindictive. Pretty flat. Until you get to that you know, third film and stuff. Stock characters, stereotypes. What kind of stock characters do we often see on TV? Especially like in sitcoms that involve families. You might totally agree with me, uh, totally disagree with me, that's fine. How are fathers often portrayed? You snickered, why? Um, when you said that, uh, what is that? I called Wendy the two children married with kids. Married with children. Married with children. Bumbling idiot. That's how fathers are often portrayed. I'm not in everything, okay? But in the last 20, 30 years, if you were to go back to when I was a kid growing up, 60s and 70s, fathers were portrayed just the opposite. They were, let's use an old, let's use a term that's very loaded today. They were the patriarchs. They were rocks. You could go to your father for any problem. You know, little um, Theodore Cleaver, Beaver, could go to Ward Cleaver, his dad, and discuss any problem he had. Any of the Walton kids could go to their father and discuss, have their problems, so to speak, resolved. Okay? Why? Those fathers weren't stuck in that sense. The fathers that are often portrayed today, or high school girls, are often portrayed as mean girls, right? Or flighty. I mean, I'm from California. Valley girls. Airheads. Just not concerned about anything but boys in the beach, you know, or cars, you know, that kind of thing. Round characters are more complex. Okay. Um, Han Solo is kind of flat. Looks a bit rounder. They're not great characters, uh, you know, to use to discuss this. Harry Potter is a round character, not fat. He's round in the sense that, you know, not a single, not a single thing motivates him. Lots of things motivate him. It's what makes him so identifiable for so many readers. They're kind of like, well, yeah, if I was in his shoes, I would do something probably similar to that. Or... He's a damn fool. He should have done X, Y, or Z. Okay. Um, character recovered all of that. Setting. Go to 159. Great. All right. Yeah, I think. Setting, 159. Talk. I think we talked a little bit about this. Setting. Context in which the action of the story occurs. What's meant by the word context, though? 
I teach a course called the History of the English Language, where we talk about the history of the English language. How English became what it is today from its origins, ultimately, five or 6,000 years ago, in the ancient Near East, the area between the Black and Caspian Seas, modern day Ukraine, Azerbaijan, kind of that area, okay? And one of the things we do in there is we talk about etymology, which is the study of the history of words. You trace a word back to its earliest form. The word context comes from Latin. Con, we see the same meaning with co before words. Like co equal, okay? And text, well, con means with or together in this context, right? Text, you've heard me refer to the stories, poems, and plays in here as texts. This is your textbook, all right? Text, however, ultimately goes back to words for weaving, like making fabric. So how in the world can you refer to a bunch of words as texts? How are they woven? Well, how do you weave fabric? You've got threads called the warp and woof. One goes this way, one goes this way. Okay. What are sentences? What are paragraphs? See, a word in and of itself is not a text. It's a word. You got to have more words put together. Texts are words that are woven together. There's a beautiful passage in the Old English poem. We don't have time to talk about this, but I will. In the Old English poem, Beowulf, where a character in the poem, after Beowulf does something magnificent, the character in the poem is described as a poet. Okay? And they're writing back to the Great Hall, and we're told the character chose words and wove them together and created a poem to describe Beowulf. So, the context in which a story is set, it's the co-weaving, the woven togetherness. But what is being woven together? The place. Time, the culture, political culture, religious culture, ideological culture, artistic culture, culinary culture, you know, all those things, what's called the social milieu of that story, right? So, Minister's Black Veil. What's the setting? New England. New England. We're actually given a place. I think it's Milford. Okay. When? That's the location. When? The book has the title, The Minister's Black Veil, and then beneath that is a subtitle, a parable, with a little, I can't remember what the little like degree sign means, or is, what it's called. And down at the bottom of the page, you have what is essentially a footnote. And it tells us, Something similar happened 80 years since. Well, next to the title is the date of publication, 1836. So go back 80 years, 1756, is when some minister did something similar to what's in the story. By the way, that's not necessarily true. That is the little footnote thing. Not that probably all part of the fiction. I, I don't know that for a fact. I'm just suggesting it as a probability. If you read Scott, uh, Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, how does it begin? The Custom House. In other words, I didn't really write this story. I found this. This is an actual account of something that happened years and years ago. Complete BS. He made it all up. All right? So, the time, place, Social milieu in which a story occurs. Okay? The setting can be a foil for a character. Okay? 
So, time, place, all that kind of stuff. Settings can invoke mood or atmosphere, etc. You know, 1756. This isn't the time period where witches are being burned at the stake. Hawthorne does have other stories set in that time period. Okay. But it is pre-revolutionary colonies. All right. And it is still a time period when there are Puritans, but they're losing emphasis. All right. More so in, I mean, there's still Puritans in New England, etc. Now, the very next thing, and we're not going to discuss it, the very next thing in your book is a short story by Ernest Hemingway called Soldier's Home. It's like five pages. Right. Setting is really important there. It's about a guy from middle America, Kansas or Oklahoma, I can't remember which, who, teenager, goes off to fight in World War I. Fights in France. He's there when the war is over. He enjoys the pleasures of Paris, you know, wine and women. Uh, once the war is over, he sees, I think, Berlin and such, and then he goes back home to Podunk, Kansas or Oklahoma. Okay? So look at his journey. He's a nobody from nowhere. He goes off and fights in a big war. He sees things. He does things. In an ideal world, no one should ever have to see or do fight a war. The war to end all wars. The Great War, as it was called. And then goes back to Nowheresville. Okay? Without even having read the story, you can kind of get an idea of the setting. What's the problem? What's the conflict? It's not World War I. The conflict is involved in a guy who goes off and then comes back. Because what has happened to him? He's changed. In other words, home isn't what it used to be. You know, how's this phrase in? Home is where the heart is. Okay? But what if home has changed? See, he comes back. He used to be fat, dumb, and happy, living in Nowheresville, America. Now, he's seen too much. People expect him to be the same. We do the same thing to soldiers. That's why so many soldiers commit suicide daily. Seemingly don't give a rat, you know what? They go off and they see and do things and they come. And I've got friends who were special forces, Marines in Fallujah during the whole, and expect them, hey, have a smiley face, be rah rah. Man. Setting is really, really important, okay? So, go on a little bit. Point of view. Where am I? Point of view, 195. What's point of view? Am I speaking, am I teaching, not literally, am I speaking or teaching from your point of view? No, I'm not. I'm speaking from mine. Point of view is how and from whose perspective, remember talking the other day about perspective, the story is told. Okay. What we know, how we feel about the events, are shaped by the author's choice of point of view. The narrator, obviously, affects how we understand the story. Now, there's a story in here, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, that we're not going to read by Herman Melville called Bartleby the Scribner. The narrator in there is a liar. He's unreliable. That's a kind of a narrator we're going to talk about briefly. So if the narrator is a liar, do you take everything the narrator says as being true? If you know something, if you walked into this class and you heard that everything I say in here is all lies, I won't say BS, because BS can be true, but it can be false also. 
But lies, intentional falsehoods. What would that do to everything you hear? You probably go, whoosh. Okay? So, point of view. You can have different kinds of narrators. Third person narrator, where somebody is looking in and reporting on what the action is. Right? So, omniscient, it's exactly what it sounds like. All knowing. Let's say these guys are all characters in a story, and I'm the narrator. If I'm an omniscient narrator, then I can tell us what she's thinking, that he's thinking, that he's thinking, that she's thinking, that she's thinking. We, we hear so-and-so thought. But it applies to everybody in the story. We're told more than just, you know, one or two or even a half dozen characters, all right? Limited omniscient, an oxymoron, right? How can you be omniscient and have that omniscience limited? Takes us into two characters, or maybe four characters' minds. The Harry Potter novels are told from a limited, omniscient character. We're told, at various points, what Harry is thinking. We're told what Hermione is thinking. We're told what Ron is thinking. We're told what Dumbledore is thinking. Okay? I don't think we're told what everybody thinks. All right? So, omniscient, limited omniscient. Objective, where the, where the narrator doesn't see inside anyone's mind. So if we're never told what somebody thinks, how do we learn what somebody thinks? Action in speech. The character tells us what he or she is thinking. That's the hardest kind of right. Why? Because that, that almost becomes drama. Because everything is speech and action. Okay? I mean, you can still get descriptions and things like that. What else? Editorial omniscience, neutral omniscience. Editorial omniscience is when the narrator makes comments, kind of editorial comments, like just um, comments about the truth or falsehood of what somebody says, or comments about somebody somebody's character. The evil rotten Lord Voldemort. That's editorial omniscience. That's the narrator telling us, I want you to think that this person is evil and rotten. Okay? Neutral omniscience, we, we don't get that at all. Or the good heroic Harry. That's editorial omniscience. Okay? Limited omniscient narrator, more confined, etc., etc. Stream of consciousness. What's meant by that? I'll be the first to tell you. Most of my classes are kind of stream of consciousness. I don't, I do have a filter. It's just, it sometimes doesn't work. And that's why I'll say, shouldn't have said that. What does it mean? Stream of consciousness narrator, it's like when you have to write a paper and the first thing you do after doing some research and stuff, and you sit down with a pen and paper or at your computer, what do you do? You just dump, right? You just start spewing words. Okay? There are actual novels written that way. The greatest one, some call it great, James Joyce's Ulysses. And it's just constant stream of consciousness of the characters. If it's stream of consciousness, that means there's no real grammar. Why? Because I challenge anybody in here to think in perfectly grammatical terms. When I meet somebody for the first time, they go, oh, what do you do? I'm an English professor. They usually go, one of two things. Oh, I hated English. <laughs> or, well, I'm not going to say anything because you're going to correct my English. I'm like, don't worry about it. None of us speaks grammatically perfect English. Okay? Um, uh, first person narrator can be a participant. Next page. Then his first person narrator is a, is a character within the story. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Begins with three words. Call me Ishmael. Call me Ishmael. Because Ishmael is the narrator of the story. And he's a participant in the story. It's all told from his point of view. Okay? 
can be a minor character. Ishmael's not a major character. Ahab's a real, you know, major character. What else? You can have unreliable, as I talked about with Barnaby. Go on. I know we're running out of time. I didn't have to pitch. Um, we'll stop there. We'll talk briefly about symbolism, theme, style, tone, and irony on Monday. We will do Minister's Black Veil on Monday. I will put up, don't give me one minute, I will put up a quiz today or tomorrow. So look for it on the front page of the D2L. There will be an announcement, a 10 point 10 point quiz that will just be over these terms. We've talked about a lot more than 10 terms. It'll just be 10 terms. Fill in the blank, true, false, multiple choice, something or all of the above, right? But it'll count only as extra credit. So if you get a zero, it's not going to hurt you at all. If you get 10 points, you got 10 extra points of credit, right? It's just designed to give you an idea of what the quizzes might look like. Probably the exact same questions or types of things will show up on the next three quizzes after that. The next three quizzes will primarily be about the works of literature we're talking about, but there will be questions about the literary terms also. Okay? All right. Have a good weekend. I'll send an email about it, and I'll post an announcement on D2L. Thank you. Yep. Have a good day. If you came in late, see me so I make sure I get you.